give the Lord a praise in the house on this morning. Some of y'all ain't praised God all morning. You might as well go ahead and take an opportunity now. For surely this is the day that the Lord has made. Let us do what? I said let us do what? You ought to rejoice then. You in the house of the Lord. I don't see no casket laid out in here. We're not here for a funeral service. You just got through eat for Thanksgiving. Somebody ought to act like they're thankful for what it is that God is doing in your life. Who woke you up this morning? What nobody but God. Who put food on your table? What nobody but God. Who got air in your lungs right now? It ain't nobody but God. And if that's a fact, then let the redeem of the Lord. God like this. Who wouldn't serve him? Who wouldn't serve him? We give God glory and praise. I don't know about y'all, but we can go ahead and go home. We didn't already had worship. We didn't already had service. I tell y'all, that's how I don't understand how a blind, crippled, and crazy man can't worship God. I don't understand how nobody in their right mind can't give God the praise that is due to him. Because some of y'all can attest to the fact, preacher, I ain't got to think back the way back when. Preacher, I can look back over the past few days of my life and see how God has provided for me and how God has made ways for me and since he's been good enough for me like that I ain't got no choice but to come out and bless him now some of y'all may be right there y'all doing all this well well I just came to give God praise I didn't come for all of that well you might just want to find you another seat and you can sit there but there may be somebody that came in here this morning with hell going on in your life you got hell going on in your house you got things going on you said preacher this might be my last opportunity, so while I got this chance, I'm going to give God the praise that is due to him. Who would serve? Who would serve a God like this? He's a wonderful Savior. Y'all sure not this morning. I tell you, y'all sure not this morning. We thank God for his presence. Above all else, because he says, well, two or three are gathered in my name touching and agreeing on anything he said I'm right there in the midst of it. We would be no different than a Toastmasters or a Rotary Club that assembles once a week but the thing that makes the difference is the presence of the Almighty God for he said in his word that where the spirit of the Lord is there is liberty to set you free and he is here on this morning so guess what you may have came in here bound and shackled down by the various things of this life but you can leave rejoicing because the spirit of the Lord is here and that is what makes the difference it is so good to see those of you that are here this morning man I was sitting on there looking I see just about every seat this morning is full except a few so we praise God for that we praise God for those of you that are here on this morning, and we thank God for those of you that are watching us via live stream. As always, we're glad to have those of you that are visiting with us. I'm glad um, to have my little brother Timothy. He's still in town with me. I'm glad to have him here with me. Yeah, I know y'all. I know y'all to think it was another of me today. Go right, you know. But uh, yeah, and I got my brother and my friend Cortez. He's here, and he has his son uh, here with him this morning. So glad to have you all here with us. You ain't got to watch us online the day you get to be here. Praise God. Praise God. Amen. Hopefully everyone is coming off of a wonderful Thanksgiving week. Prayerfully you had a wonderful time with your family and with your loved ones and really just got to think about things in life of what are you really thankful for. Amen. I know we had a good time. We ended off on uh, yesterday, and I tell y'all, I'm tired. We've been ripping and running the past three, four days, but we had an awesome time, and I wouldn't trade it for anything in the world. Um, but anybody come to hear a word from the Lord this morning? Amen. I've already been told that the Jaguars are losing, I mean, playing today, and y'all, and uh, some of y'all trying to go and watch them look win today. Uh, so, uh, if you say man, not too loud though, because that's gonna make me think you want me to sit down. And that's gonna cause me to multiply what Richard called 30 minutes. Uh, so, uh, this morning, uh, we'll be in Matthew chapter four. Matthew chapter four, verses one through four. And then we will journey over and look at one verse out of Math, uh, Matthew chapter 26, and that is verse number 39. The grass withers and the flower thereof shall fade away. 
but the word of our God shall stand forever. First, we'll be in Matthew chapter 4, verses 1 through 4. You got it? Say, preacher, I'm waiting. All right, all right. Then was Jesus led up of the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. And when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he was afterward and hungry. And when the tempter came to him, he said, If thou be the Son of God, command that these stones be made bread. But he answered and said, It is written. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeded out of the mouth of God. Amen. Then we'll be in Matthew chapter 26 and simply verse number 39. Going a little further, he fell with his face to the ground and prayed, My father, if it is possible, may this cup be taken away from me. Yet not my will. But let thy will be done. And may the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart, dear Lord, be acceptable in thy sight. If you would, go with me to our Heavenly Father in prayer. Dear wise and gracious Heavenly Father, it is indeed we are grateful for this time. We're grateful for this gathering and this moment. Father, we're grateful simply to be in your presence. You're so awesome. You're so holy. If we were to call out all of your attributes, God, we'd be here all day. You're just God, just like that. Father, we pray at this time, Father, as we prepare to feast at the table of your word, Father, that those that came seeking you this morning might be able to find you. That somebody this morning that has a wayward relationship with you, Father, that they might be brought close to you. May someone that does not even know you in the pardon of their sins at the conclusion of the matter ask that question, what is it that I must do in order that my soul might be saved? Father, we can't do anything until you come, so we ask that you would please, Father, hide me behind your cross that no flesh would take any glory in that that you ought to receive. And Father, if you do this for us, we'll be so ever mindful to give you the glory. It is in the name of Jesus we pray that all those that love God say amen. 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 I want to talk about this morning briefly, just simply the temptations of Jesus. The temptations of Jesus. And sidebar, this is some encouragement for us this morning. Because if Jesus was tempted, don't you think you're going to be tempted as well? If Jesus had to go through some times and had to go through some experiences in his life where he was not just able to trust in himself and in his own strength, but he found himself getting to a point to where even he called upon the Father, well, we're going to have to call upon the Father. So you've often heard, even in your Bible, it's labeled right there in Matthew chapter 4. When you talk about temptation, it describes this as the great temptation. In Matthew chapter 4, you remember this story. It's beginning his ministry, and Jesus had just been baptized by John over there in the Jordan River. And he was led of the Spirit into the wilderness. And while he's there, after fasting for 40 days and 40 nights, I didn't say four days and four nights, I said 40 days and 40 nights, no food for 40 days and 40 nights, and, 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 and I've gone, you know, I've gone on a few fasts, but I ain't even going to sit here and tell you that it been no 40 days. Uh, I'm not even going to tell you it went four days. You be told I struggle with four hours, praise God. But... And you've gone on fast, but they have not lasted that long. Forty days in the wilderness, and particularly in this area that Jesus was in, you got to realize down there by the Dead Sea, it's hot, it's dry, it's extremely hard conditions, and that is exactly where Jesus found himself. And here you got the devil coming and showing himself, and I would say in the flesh, but he was not in the flesh because you know that the devil is a spirit too, right? Just like God is a spirit, that Satan is also a spirit, and he shows up and he tries to tempt Jesus. And what does he tell Jesus when he comes on the scene? He says that if you are the son of God, turn these stones into bread. You're talking about a man that's been out here with no food for 40 days and 40 nights. Man, I'd have been cooking up for filet mignons. Uh, uh, for, uh, I'd have been had something, everything going on out there. But he was tempted. 
And then he takes him to the pinnacle of the temple, and the temple being as high as it was, in essence, the devil said, you know what? Jump. For the scripture said, uh, if you would jump, that he'll give his angels charge over you. And he added these little words, at all times. Blessed at any time. That's not what the original quote says, but I said that because I want you to understand that just as well as you know the Bible, the devil knows the Bible as well. And he will take the word of God and he'll take scriptures and he'll add to them and he'll take away from them to make you feel like you are justified in the things that you want to do. And he said at any time, well, the original text that he's quoting, Jesus is quoting from a scripture in the book of Psalms, and it doesn't say at any time, but that's not how the enemy does. That's just a little footnote, and then this is interesting. Then he showed him all of the kingdoms of the world. Satan showed Jesus all of the kingdoms of the world, and I love what it said, taking him high up. Showing him all the kingdoms of the world. Look at that in a moment. Showing him all of that stuff. In other words, y'all, it took Satan literally a couple minutes to show Jesus everything that he had to offer him. In other words, y'all, the best that the devil has to offer you and me ain't going to take but a few minutes for him to show us. But the Bible says something different about our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. It says that of his kingdom, there'll be no end. I, 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 from his kingdom, y'all, there will be no end. What does that mean? From everlasting to everlasting, he is going to be God. Whether he is Alpha, he is what? Omega. He is the beginning. He is the end. The author and the finisher of our faith. Jesus resisted the temptation to bow down to the devil. As a matter of fact, as great as the temptation was, nowhere do we read where Jesus was saying, well, you know what, Father? If it's possible, this temptation is just so severe. Let this cup pass from me. He never prayed to get out of it because it was so hard. And what I'm proposing to you, church, that the temptation in the wilderness may not have been the greatest temptation that he ever faced. On, but one of the greatest temptations that Jesus ever faced is in Matthew chapter 26. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. He knew that within hours he was going to be hanging on the cross. He knew not only that, but that the pastors by were going to mock him. That they would clear their throats and that they would spit upon him. He knew that the blood would be pouring down his face and it would be pumping through the holes in his hands, his feet and his side. The scars on his back was bleeding. He knew what was facing him, church. But the Bible says in Hebrews chapter 12 and verse number 2, For the joy that was set before him. He endured the cross thinking nothing about the shame. Thinking nothing about it, y'all. As a matter of fact, while he was on the cross, he couldn't think about the shame. Why? Because he was thinking about you. Not only was he thinking about you, but guess what? He was thinking about me as well. And I don't know about y'all, church, but if I can't praise God for anything else, I can praise God that he had me on his mind when I was lost, when I was drifting, when I was on my way to a place that I should not have been. I'm thankful that I had a God enough that loved me and cared enough about me not to leave me where I was, but to come right out there and get me. Tell somebody this morning, God will come and get you if you need him to. He knew what was about to happen, y'all. And in that moment, when he had the greatest, I'll say, justification to back out. The times we're most vulnerable to our temptation, church, is when we can justify our way out of it. That the enemy will send temptations and offers to us and he'll dangle that little temptation in front of you. Do you not understand Jesus told him that I can call legions of angels at this moment and that they will come and that they would rescue me? Y'all, this 
is the same man that in one night's time, he called one angel and the angel came down and killed 185,000 soldiers. So if Jesus would have thought at any moment for them to come and rescue him, they would have came at his beck and call. But I'm glad that he stayed on the cross. Amen, somebody. I'm glad that he stayed on the cross. I'm glad that he endured the cross, despising the shame. Because had he not stayed on the cross, there would be no hope. We would be without God and we would be lost in this world. But I'm glad that he loved me enough to stay on the cross. I'm glad that he loved me enough to take that beating all night long. And not only that, but to rise again on the third day with all power in his hands. As I said, in Hezekiah's day, y'all, 185,000 soldiers, 185, soldiers were taken out by one angel. He didn't even call Michael. He didn't even bother Gabriel. He just looked over in the corner and said, hey, you go down there. And by the time the angel got through flapping his wings, what God had set forth had already been done. There's no telling, church, what God can do in our lives if we would simply call on him. If we would simply surrender ourselves to him. If we would simply say, Lord, not my will, but let your will be done. Even when I don't understand, guess what? Let your will be done. Even when it hurts sometimes, guess what, Lord? Let your will be done. Even when I don't understand, Lord, let your will done in my life the greatest temptation Jesus faced one of them I believe was in that moment church why do I say that because in that moment he realized I ain't got to do this I haven't sinned I haven't done anything wrong and nobody could blame him if he did that but I know my father wants me to do this and even though I can't justify not doing this, I could come up with plenty of reasons why I would be justified to resist this temptation. Church, our greatest, most deepest temptations come when you feel like you're justified. When you feel like you're good, but you know you're not good. When there's no justification for the temptation, when you know it's absolutely black and white, and you're saying it's purple, and it's green, and it's turquoise, and it's every other thing except what it's supposed to be. And I believe, church, that the greatest temptation that the enemy brings in my life and in your life is when we can justify doing wrong. It's quiet, but that's all right. I'm going somewhere. Look at your neighbor and say, he'll be at your house in a minute. He, 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 yeah. he coming down the street. He just making stops. Guess what? You might well go and open the door because I'm coming right on up in there. Because aren't y'all glad that the word of God does not just come to make you feel good and to get you all aroused and excited. But that the word of God, if you are in opposition to God, the word of God will get you back in your place. That's why the Bible said that the word of God is profitable for instruction and righteous for, 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 for profit and for doctrine for reproof for correction that the man of God may be perfect thoroughly furnished under every good work I would be less of a preacher if every sermon I preached to you was all happy clapping and shouting and nothing to get you thinking hey maybe I need to change and I believe that's the problem in the church today is that we all want a word that, oh, glory to God. Thank you, Jesus. But we don't want anything that's going to cause us to look in the mirror and say, you know what? That ain't for y'all. That's for me. You ever heard somebody say, oh, he showed priest to y'all today. I'm not preaching to y'all, I'm preaching to all. I'm preaching to everybody. Because guess what? Even the one that preaches the word of God, he can't preach it without getting affected by the word of God. That's why the Bible says that the word of God is like a two-edged sword. So whether I'm holding or receiving, ouch. Sometimes you can't say amen, all you can say is, But when you 
justify church doing wrong. When other people say, you know what, child, I don't blame you. You should have been dead. You should have been dead somebody. And all the while they're saying that, you know deep within your heart, I have not done what I'm supposed to do. I have not been all of who I should be. Let me show you what I'm talking about. Y'all remember Abraham, don't you? Abraham, take your son, your only son, Isaac, put the wood on his back. 17 years old, y'all, for three days, he carried enough wood to build an altar and a big fire. He carried it on his back, and he goes to the top of the mountain, and then God said, kill the boy. Now, he could have been justified in that moment. Wait a minute. You done already said in your word to the Moabites that they were cursed for killing their children. For causing their children to pass through the fire. And I know you don't like human sacrifices. Therefore, this must not be God talking. I know this is not something that you would want me to do. But church, we got to have the same spirit that Abraham had. Why do I say that? That even when you don't understand, you don't question God. You don't know, Lord, why are you doing it like this? How is it going to happen like that? Lord, not my will, but let your will be done. Goes up. He could have been justified, y'all, but instead he did what it was that God had instructed of him to do. And can I put y'all on a news flash this morning? I know you didn't know it, but if you are looking for an excuse not to serve God, you're going to find as many as you want to find. If you are looking for an excuse not to come out and worship God and give him the praise, you're going to find as many excuses as you want to find because the devil does not want you to serve God. He does not want you to be faithful. He wants you to fall by the wayside we used to sing a song Lord so many falling by the wayside but Lord help me to stand and even in a day and time where we are living in where so many people are falling by the wayside folk don't love God no more folk don't want to serve God no more folk don't want to give God none of their time in a world like that Lord even though everybody else is falling by the wayside help me to stand Help me to run this race, Lord. Help me to be able to stand. That picture of Abraham and Isaac going up on the mountain, y'all, is a mirror picture of our Lord and Savior hanging out on the cross of Calvary and dealing with the temptation. Do you know how much of an insult to injury it was? After Jesus had already been beaten to a bloody pulp, crown of thorns had been placed upon his head, and now you got the very same folk that was taking ten for a place home from the feeding of the 5,000, from the very same folk that was there when you healed the woman that had an issue of blood, from the very same folk that were there when you went and called out Lazarus by name, from the very same folk that were there when you raised Jairus' daughter from the point of death, and now they they are the ones spitting on you. They are the ones mocking you. Could you imagine? I don't know about y'all, but I'm just putting myself in the face of Jesus. Man, I'd have had all kind of fire coming down from heaven. Just raining. Just raining down. And y'all, y'all mean you going to do me like this? I thought I'd have fed you. I thought I'd have healed your cousin. Your cousin had to do with her. And I did all of that for you. And this is how you're going to return the favor? But I'm so glad that even though he was 100% God and 100% man, that he acted as 100% God. He did not fall to the temptation. He did not fall into the snare, but he stayed there, church, until it was accomplished. He stayed there, church, until it was done. And can I tell you, God wants us to stay here until all is done, until all is done over with, church. We can't be so flimsy and so lackadaisical that with every wind that blows our way, we're blown over here and we're blown over there. That we cannot find any security. We need to stick with God, church, if you expect to get where you want to be. One angel... Stop Abraham from killing his son. 
But 72,000 couldn't stop the father from allowing his son to die on the cross. And guess what, y'all? He died for you and for me. Think about this. Jesus died at a chance that you might love him back. There was no assurance that you were going to be faithful and that you were going to love him. But Jesus died at a chance, at an opportunity that you might be saved, that you might come to the knowledge of the truth. And I would encourage every single one of you that are blood-washed believers in Christ. How many of y'all glad to be saved this morning? That's what I need to talk about first. How many of y'all are glad that your name has been written down in the Lamb's Book of Life? If you are really glad about that, it's going to show in your faith is going to show and how devoted you are to the cause of Christ and I want to let you know I don't care how black your suit is I don't care how white your dress is I don't care what your position is you are going to be faced with temptations and can I tell you that the higher you go up the greater your temptation the higher you go up church the greater the temptations that you have to face. But there is no temptation that is overtaking you. But such as is common to man. For God will with the temptation. What will he do? He's going to provide a way of escape. Tell somebody I'm on my way out this thing. I know it may look dark right now. I know it may feel bad right now. But I'm so glad. Somebody said trouble don't last always. I'm glad that it's not going to be like this. It's always apparently God has me here for a set time for an appointed time to learn something that I need to learn so that I can be better when I come out on the other side of this thing. He stayed on the cross church. The times that we are being tested church the most, as I say, is when we can justify our own. When you can justify being nasty to folks. Well, she got a bad attitude. That don't mean you get a bad attitude. What kind of Christianity is that? What kind of Christianity is that? Well, she didn't speak to me. I ain't going to speak to her. Well, you know, they didn't do this, so I'm not going to do it. When are we going to get to the point to where we get out of the sandbox on the playground and we start actually being who it is that God has called us to be? There are too many people that will let the simplest, smallest thing diminish their faith in Christ and cause them to forsake God and run away. But let me tell y'all, I don't care how much the rain fall, how much the wind blow, I'm going to be like a tree that's planted by the rivers of the water. Water, I shall not be moved. I don't care what's going on. I ain't leaving God. Where you gonna go? Remember when Jesus told his followers a hard saying, and it said that there were many that walked with him up until that point that turned away and they walked with him no more. Jesus looked at them up. Y'all gonna go too? You gonna join the crowd? And he said, Father, to where shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. Well, if that's true, why are we running to everything else except God? Why are we running to everything else except the rock that is higher than I? Why are we running to everything else except that stone that the builders rejected but has now become the head of the corner? David's greatest temptation was not when he was caught with his binoculars on his roof. Amen, like both. Yeah. Great, David's greatest temptation was not when he got caught looking at Bathsheba. That was his greatest weakness. That was his greatest failure. But that was not his greatest temptation. His greatest temptation was when King Saul who had made his life a living H-E double hockey sticks. King Saul, the man that he had fought wars for, the man that he had fought a giant for, the man that he had risked his life for, that same man took a javelin, y'all, and became jealous 
and tried to kill him. And chased him like a dog, like an animal. Until he was homeless. Playing crazy, y'all. He was up and down. He was the first one to literally go cuckoo for Cocoa Puffs. He was out there in the cave and one day Saul was chasing him. And he says, I'm going in this cave. To one of his assistants and his whole army. He says, wait here. I'm going to go in and relieve myself. And he goes into the cave. And in the most vulnerable position, guess who's in the shadows in the cave hiding? It was David. Abishai and Joab, two mighty men. One of them killed 800 and the other one killed a giant that had six fingers and six toes. They were both mighty men, not to speak of how mighty David was. He killed Goliath. And the Bible said that Abishai and Joab started whispering in David's ear. Listen to the justification. Listen to them. They said, kill him. Yeah, this your opportunity, David. While ain't nobody else, go ahead and get him. Go ahead and kill him. This is a problem. God, listen to him. God, if you read the story, God has delivered your enemy into your hand. Kill him. And while he's doing this business, kill him. Don't you know, church, that that was his greatest temptation? Because all of heaven was watching him. And he remembered that old dusty scripture he had put down somewhere from the Old Testament that said, touch not mine anointed. Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. I will repay. So stop going around here trying to get even with folk, trying to do folk in just because folk did you in. He said that vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. I'll pay them back. Vengeance is mine, but I could do it and be justified. Folk would understand why I killed him after everything he's been trying to do to me. But God said, don't touch it. I am the one. Two things belong to God, folks. That's your tithe and vengeance. Amen, lights. Two things that belong to God. I got to preach all of it, right? Two things that belong to God that you ain't got no business messing with. That's your tithe and vengeance. They both belong to God. But you, I tell you, we got vengeful Christians walking around here. Can I tell y'all, we got folk in the church that if you ask them, they say they on their way to heaven. Y'all, they got a church. They say, I'm a member of the church of Christ. They got that long necklace with the cross medallion on it. And these are the very folk that are walking around here mad at folk for 10 and 12 years. Can't let stuff go. Won't speak to nobody. You done forgot why you're mad. You just know you're mad. You went in the store looking for one thing. And you seen them on that eye, and now you all the way over there in electronics. You know you ain't winning to get no electronics. You just trying to dodge folks. You don't want to talk to them. You need to let that stuff go. Vengeance belongs to God. You better be careful going around here trying to dig ditches for folk. Because the very one that you dug for somebody else, guess what? You are in right up in it yourself. Church, I'll let you know. The Lord will fight your battles. The Lord will fight your battles. The Lord is ready, willing, and able to come to your side when you are faced with temptations. Because the thing is, church, he knows that you are not able to overcome the temptations by your own strength and by your own merit. So what I love about God, because God ain't just going to let you get through easy. This is what I love about God. God will make you work and do up until the point that you are not able to do anything. And then God will come in on the scene. And somebody's here, you can attest to the fact, preacher, he's a God that's never early. And preacher, he's a God that's never late. So Somebody said, preacher, he's always right on time. Preacher, I know that's true because I was down on my luck and he showed up right on time. Preacher, my back was against the wind and he showed up right on time. Preacher, I didn't know how I was going to get out, but he showed up 
and he showed up right on time. There is no justification for wrongdoing. Sorry, not sorry. There is no justification. Oh, well, I'm in the church. It's all right. Well, you know, I've been baptized. It's all right. You know, I went late this Sunday. I didn't make it last Sunday, but you know, it's all right. There is no justification for you knowing what the Bible says to him that knows to do good and does it not. It becomes a sin. It ain't no way around it. And I know that's a word we don't like to hear, but guess what? Sin is still a thing. And the Bible still says that if you die in your sins, that where God is, you cannot go. Christians got to get out of this thinking that, well, well, I'm in the church. That's all I got to do. Now I'm on my way to heaven. There's a lifestyle change, church, that has to take place. Folk ought to be able to see a difference between the BC you and the now you. They ought to be able to see a difference in the you that used to be around to the you that you are now that you've come into the knowledge of Jesus Christ conversations that you used to entertain you shouldn't entertain them anymore places that you used to go you shouldn't go to those places anymore things that you used to be involved in you shouldn't be involved in anymore he that the son has set free is free indeed you don't have to be bound we're bound because we want to be bound and we got to get out of this business of, of making excuses and, oh, I did it because of this. And I didn't know you did it because that's what you wanted to do. Amen. Oh, well, the devil made the devil ain't got that much power. He ain't made you do nothing. Oh, you know, the devil made me do it. Stop giving him the credit and say that that's what you want. You didn't come to church because you didn't want to come to church. You aren't serving God. Why? Because you don't want to serve God. God is just not your priority. And let me tell you, God can do a whole lot with somebody that'll just be honest and say, you know what? Lord, I have not been all of who I should be. I have not done everything that I know I should have done. But God, I want you to work on me. God, I want you to create in me a clean heart and renew a right spirit within me. And Lord, while I'm waiting on my chain, I I know you've already said in your word that they that wait upon the Lord, he shall renew their strength. They're going to mount up as wings as eagles. They're going to run and not be weary. They'll walk and not faint. I preached on last Sunday that God wants to help you on your leaning side. All of us need help in the area of our weaknesses in the area of our temptations too many people Christians that's what I'm talking about now too many people that claim Christ but live as if they never met it and we got to get out of this because you know you know on Sunday and Wednesday you would think we mother Mary you would think that Jesus has been reincarnated in the flesh and he's standing before you. But if we could see just like God every single other day of your life, is Jesus exalted the same way that you exalt him when you come together with your brothers and your sister. We got to get out of this business of trying to live good enough for people and living good enough for people to say that we've done good and we've done a good job. I don't care if y'all don't like me. I don't care. You can talk about me till your teeth fall out. Guess what? I'm still Trevante Tremont Peterson. I've still been fearfully and wonderfully made in the eyesight of God. We got to get out of this what they gonna say they say this at the end of your life church you are not gonna be standing before any of these individuals but you are gonna be standing before all wise all powerful all just God and you got the answer to him you got an answer to him so many of us are allowing our temptations to have us when we need to have our temptations. We need to have power over that stuff, church. 
And it's not going to happen by us trying to handle it by our own. And then once it gets to a point that we're not able to handle it, we just ignore it and act like it's not there anymore, church. We need to deal with these issues. Too many families are not the families that they need to be because don't nobody want to deal with the issues. So many relationships are being tossed, tops and turvy because people don't want to deal with the issues that they got to deal with. But even in your relationship with God, can I tell you, you got some issues that you need to deal with if there's any lukewarmness in your walk with God, you got some issues that you need to deal with if there's anger in your heart if there's malice in your heart if you don't like nobody if you're rolling your eyes at a folk if you're putting your nose up in the air folk, you got some things that you need to deal with, oil and water cannot mix in the same way sin and Christianity, they cannot I admit, you cannot say that I'm a Christian, but I still don't like folk. I'm a Christian, but I still don't like her, and I don't hear. How can you say that you love God, somebody that you ain't never laid your eyes on, but yet you hate your brother and sister that you see on a daily basis? Let it go. You are going to be tempted. Why are you going to be tempted? Because the devil wants to make you out to be a liar. Yeah. That is why you're going to be tempted. That's why the Bible says, let any man that thinks he stands, take heed unless he fall. You know, and you got to be careful about walking around saying what you won't ever do. You got to be careful. Well, I wouldn't have did that if I was her. And I wouldn't have did it like that if I was her. Let me tell y'all. I don't care who you are. You've been in the church 80 years. Guess what? When desire and opportunity meet each other. You can be Pope Francis. Guess what? You are subject to temptation. That's why you got to train yourself. That's why the scripture says that we got to deny the flesh. We got to deny the flesh. We got to bring that thing under subjection. Because let me tell you, temptation don't have to always work that way. Temptation can catch you. I'm going to be real with you. Temptation can catch you while you sit there in the middle of the night and you scrolling through the channels and you get the Cinemax and HBO and all that kind of stuff is going on and the remote just don't want to change the channel. It seemed like the battery that went dead and instead of you changing the channel, you just say, oh, I'm going to sit right here and you done got your popcorn and you don't want to fix you something to eat. That's how temptation will catch up on you. It'll make you out to be a liar. But can you see how so easily we fall into the temptation? How so easily we allow things to grab a hold of us and just take us for a ride. That's why the song said, don't let the devil ride. God, if you let him ride, what's going to happen? And let me tell you, you don't want to drive. And let me tell you, and let me tell you, the devil, sin is just like this. Sin, as I said, keeps you longer than you ever wanted to stay. And it always makes you pay more than you want to. Somebody say it like this, that sin is like a credit card. You can enjoy it now, but guess what? You're going to pay for it later. You can pay for it later. So some of us right now, pre pre thank you, we may enjoy the things that we are doing, but guess what? You may enjoy it right now, but one day you're going to have to give an account to God. You're going to have to say to God why you thought it was okay. Why you thought you were justified. Why you thought it was nothing wrong with it. How many of us have an answer that's good enough? How many of us have an answer good enough to say, well, Lord, you know, I know you died for me, but I just didn't feel like living for you. Lord, I know you woke me up and I know every piece of food I ate, it was you that provided it for me. I know every sip of water I drank, it was you that provided it for me. But Lord, you know, when things happen for me, good things happen for me, I just thought you gave it to me for me to keep it for myself. I didn't think that you blessed me so that I can turn around and be a blessing to you. We are tempted even in that area. You know that, right? You are tempted every Sunday when it's offering time. You are tempted. Do I get up and go to the bathroom? 
before the plate comes around. Do I act like I left something in the car and go out to my car and by the time I get back offering to be over? Do I think, well, you know, uh, I really want that new hairdo or whatever it is. Just got your hair did last week. But I want, you know, I, I really want this and I really want that. And you know what? God can wait right now. So I'm going to put that on hold and I'm going to get what it is that I want. Again, two things that don't belong to you. What is it? And when we take from God, God takes that personally, church. We are tempted in all, not just that, we are tempted when it comes to the communion. We are tempted to not put our mind on Christ, but to think about the ham hocks that IGA got on sale. And how we're going to go get some after worship service and we're going to put them on. We are tempted to think about everything except to put our mind on Christ. We are tempted, even when the, the, whoever is preaching is preaching, somebody come through the door, everybody. I thought Jesus was walking through the door. I had to turn around. We are tempted in every area, church, because the devil does not want you to be focused. He despises an individual that is focused and it's made up your mind that you're going to live for God. Amen. And that you're going to do what it is that God has called for you to do. I'm aware this morning that there are many of us that are experiencing temptations right now. And we don't even recognize it. Why is that? Because the temptation has been going on for so long in our lives. That it's just become second nature to us. My daddy was a liar, so I'm going to be a liar. My great-grandfather was a cusser, so I'm going to be a cusser. This person was that, and this person was that. What the other people did ain't got nothing to do with you. You make up in your mind that you are going to serve God. You make up in your mind that you are going to be faithful because none of us in here are going to make it in off of the faithfulness of another individual. You're going to make it on your own merit. Your own life and by your own choices. But church, you don't have to fall to temptation. You can stand against it. God has come. He said in his word, he said that if God be for you, there is nothing that is too big that we're not able to face it. There's nothing that's just too big and it's too large that we're not able to handle it and we're not able to overcome it because greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. I'm glad that I don't serve a dead God, but that I serve a living God. I'm glad that I God that I serve, he's sitting high and he's looking low. I'm glad that the God that I serve, he knows everything that I'm dealing with. He knows everything that I'm going through, church. That's why the Bible says, thank God that we have not a high priest that cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmity. For Jesus was in like manners tempted just like we are. What was the difference? why he was qualified to be our all-sufficient Savior. Because we know that in order for a new covenant, we're living in a new covenant, right? That's right, is that? Since in order for a new covenant to come into effect, we realize that there had to be the shedding of innocent blood. There had to be the shedding of innocent and pure blood. And since they were in a time now to where the blood of bulls and goats and rams, it was not going to do. They had to find one that had some sinless blood. Moses was a good man, but Moses had an attitude problem. Noah was a 
good man, but Noah had a drinking problem. David, he was a good man, but David had a womanizing problem. All of these men, they were good men, and they did great things, but they were not qualified to be our all-sufficient Savior. And that is why it was necessary for God in heaven to take on the form of man, to come down and lay down his life as a ransom for our sin. He was the only one that was found that had blood that was pure and innocent without spot and without blemish and that's why he was qualified to go to the cross qualified to be pierced in his side qualified to have a crown of thorns shoved down on his sacred head qualified to be spit in his face he was qualified because none of us would have stayed there. We would not have been able to endure it. We would not have been able to overcome it. But I'm glad, church, that that same God, that, oh, that same Jesus that overcame his temptation while he was out there in the wilderness and the same Jesus that overcame his temptation while he was there in the garden of Gethsemane is the same God. Somebody say the same God. He is the same one that's going to walk with me through my temptation. He is the same God and he walks with me and he talks with me and he tells me that I am his own and the joy that we share as we tarry there none other has ever known I want to encourage you this morning you may be walking through the fire but you are not walking through the fire by yourself you may be running through the ringer this morning but you are not being ran through the ringer by yourself and he walks with me and he talks with me and he tells me that I am his own and the joy that we share has ever known. God wants to help you this morning. But he can't help nobody that won't admit that they need help. What's the first step to recovery? Too many individuals don't want to admit that they struggle. People don't want to admit that they are weak in certain areas. I got it. I can handle it. And you, you may think that you can handle it now. But let me tell you, every single one of us will be faced with a situation in life that we are not able to handle it. All of our strength and all of our wisdom is not able to solve it. All of us will get to a point to where we got to say, Lord, I can't. But you can. Lord, I can't do anything about it. But I'm going to trust you. That is why, as I gave the example of King Hezekiah, after Sennacherib had wrote him that threatening letter and said, you know what? I don't care about the God that you serve. I'm going to come there. I'm going to kill you. I'm going to lay waste to you. And the Bible says that when Hezekiah got that letter, he didn't cry. He didn't mope. He didn't complain. He took that piece of mail yes, sir. Come on. into the temple, yes, sir. spreading it out. Before the altar of God, you got mail. Don't sometimes when you get a bill in the mail, you just want to break it and lay it out and say, Because I ain't got no money. You got. Present God with your temptation. God is able, church. He's able to do what? Exceed and abundant above all that you could ever ask or think. So you may be asking and praying for God to help you deal with it, but God may be preparing you to get over it. You may be praying for, Lord, keep me comfortable while I'm here, but 
God may not even plan for you to be there for too much longer. That's what it means. He's able to do church exceeding and abundant. You're thinking here, but God is thinking way up there. Take God out of the box. We, too many of us, we get in trouble because we think we got God figured out. Well, the last time God did it like this, and the last time God did it like that. Let me tell you, we serve a God that'll blow your mind. We serve a God that just like Peter and them out there on the boat, you won't just catch enough fish. We serve a God that'll break your net. We serve a net breaking, boat sinking, blessing kind of God. And he cannot just bless you in that area. But he can bless you to be able to deal with your temptations. And whatever you're dealing with, church, God is able. But again, the first step to get into where God wants you to be is not simply admitting to another individual. Because guess what? You can tell me, well, preach, I got a problem. Me too. Well, I got issues. Me too. Preach, I'm struggling. <laughs> Me too. But that is one that you can take your burdens to, church. What we say in the song, take your burdens to the Lord and pick them back up. Well, what you been going back and looking at them for? You driving down the road, looking in the rearview mirror, trying to see about it. Let me tell you, when you give something over to God, you leave it in the hands of God. Don't worry about it. Don't fret over that thing because if you put it in God's hand, it's in good hands. And trust him to be able to take care of it. But I challenge you this morning, don't just trust God to be able to take care of the little things. If trust God for those big things in your life. There are some things that we feel good about, then there are certain things in our life that we're really struggling with. Can I tell you that even people with faith struggle? Even people with faith, you not only struggle monetarily and things like that, you struggle with unbelief. Your faith wavers from time to time. We're preaching, I'm like a tree planted by the river. My faith ain't never wavered. No. Some of y'all can say, preach, I thought I was strong. Until I had to walk up to the front of a church. Look down in the face of my loved one. And I realized I wasn't as strong as I thought I was. Preacher, it wasn't until I had to shake somebody's hand that I knew him like me. Until I knew it was some things that I was able to deal with and able to get over. And again, church, all of us can say what we won't do and what we will do based upon what we've already experienced. But there are some things that will come. Well, preach ain't nothing came my way. What they say, just keep on. When I tell you, those are the realest words that have ever been spoken. Keep living. You didn't know what your grandma was talking about. What you talking about? Well, grandma, I plan on living. I don't plan on dying no time. So keep living. Mom, why you always talking about you hurting this stuff, child? You made it. Keep living. And now some of y'all can say you used to look at your granny and them and wonder how they was doing all that crying and stuff. And now you get out of the bed, snap, crack a pop, rice crisp. You, you getting out of the bed, boom, pow, watch out. Like, oh, God. And some of y'all said, preacher, you know, it's a struggle right now. I can't just get straight up out the bed. Preacher said, I just got to put my legs over the side. And I just got to sit there for them. I'm talking to somebody. You just ain't saying amen. You know, I just got to sit there for a minute and let my brain get connected with my feet. Because I don't want to just step out and there don't be nothing out there to catch me. Preach, I used to be able to run, man. I, I, but right, preach, I used to be able to run. Now I can barely run for Jesus. <laughs> Keep it real. 
keep living. And as you keep living, you'll realize that as life goes on, and as you become closer to God, and as you become stronger in God and stronger in his word, you'll realize that, hey, you know, those things that I was dealing with back then wasn't even nothing to compare to what I'm going through right now. And you know, that's not necessarily a bad thing. That lets me know that my faith has increased. That lets me know that I am able because you know what? God already said in his word, he won't put more. That don't mean he won't make you uncomfortable. That won't mean that he won't cause you to think. But God wants you to break the mold. Some of us think we have grown as far as we can go. God wants you to get out of that mindset. God wants you to grow closer to him. God wants you to become better in him, church. My prayer, the most honest prayer that I can pray is, Lord, draw me nearer. Draw me nearer. Not just, Lord, draw me nearer, but, Lord, draw us nearer. For he said in his word, behold, how good and pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together. Lord, draw us closer together in love and unity. What did it say? Let us have that love for each other that runs from what? Heart to heart and mind to mind. If you're struggling this morning, God wants to help you. If you are battling temptations on this morning and you feel like you are just about to drown, because of everything that you are facing, God is ready, willing, and able to help you with what you're dealing with. If my brother, my sister, my friend, you are in this place on this morning and you are not yet even saved, you don't yet know God as your Lord and your Savior, come to him this morning. He said today that you hear my voice, don't worry. He's knocking even at this moment at the door of your heart. You've heard his word. Believe what it is that you've heard. Repent of your sins. Confess Christ as your savior. Be buried with him in baptism. And the Lord himself will add you to his body. My brother, my sister, if you're here today and you're struggling, don't feel bad. Don't be ashamed because you're struggling. Everybody is struggling in some area of their life. But if you stand in the need of prayer to get through what it is that you're going through, let us pray for you. For the Bible says that the prayers of the righteous, they avail it much. We all stand in the need of prayer. Amen. Amen. My brother and my sister, again, don't put off today for what you plan on doing at another time. While we have this opportunity, you can come now as together we stand and sing the song of invitation. There's a fire.